So our next talk will be coming up in just a minute. It's titled Run Towards the Fire, Forging a Career from Crisis and Stroke Awareness. And it'll be given to you by Chris Trainor. Uh, Chris here is a senior pen tester at Equifax and uh, yeah, doesn't want a fancy introduction. That's fine. All right. You should be seeing my slide deck now. Okay. Well, hey, everybody. I'm Chris Trainer. I'm a senior pen tester at Equifax. Uh, thanks for joining this talk. It's, uh, it's going to be a fun one. I'm going to share some, some experience of my own, uh, both on a career and personal side, and hopefully you find it um, interesting and, and informative. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and jump right in. So first part of this talk is going to be forging a career from crisis. Uh, I'm going to cover my path into information security and uh, talk about how it can be beneficial for others and, and what lies out there for those actually outside of security and within to take advantage of this, this possible option uh, to enhance your career. So first up, crisis alert, right? There's a, there's a crisis all the time in security and, uh, and we're trying to react to it constantly, right? So you're going you're gonna to have a lot to, to consume in this presentation, but I beg you just kind of take it slowly um, and listen to a little bit of the experience that I've had, but, but take into account your own lives and your own needs, right? So, so your career path may be different. Uh, so you, extra points to anybody who can name all the, the tools and, and the movie references and TV references on this screen here uh, before we jump right in. Okay, so as it's titled, Run Towards the Fire, right? So the fire we're going to be talking about today is, of course, the Equifax breach that was announced in September of 2017, probably to most people's awareness and tracked it over that next year or so as it developed uh, in the media and in responses and in the sec security community at large, right? So the fire that occurred was that September 2017 uh, just announcement. The breach happened before, but in September is when Equifax kind of came out and said, hey, we have this problem. There was a data breach. Now, I'm not going to spend time today talking about the hows, the what's, the whys, and, and who, who you know, was on the offending end of this breach. Right? That's not really kind of the, the purpose of what we're honing in on here. But I do want to know for those who are interested in, in kind of the metrics and, and the deep analysis of it, there is a uh, U.S. House of Representatives put out a uh, is the Committee for on Oversight and Government Reform put out a report for the Equifax breach back in December of 2018, just over a year after the announcement, with all of the findings. So I encourage anybody who wants to learn more about what happened, where the lapses were, what was corrected, uh, and how the actual breach occurred, uh, to go out there and find that. Again, that's a U.S. House of Representatives uh, put out the report in December 2018. You should be able to, to probably find it off of that bit of information. Uh, so the fire, again, back to that, Equifax was receiving a lot of heat and a lot of attention, and so much so that it was actually voted the most hated company in the United States uh, shortly after the breach announcement. And Everywhere you looked in September and that last part of 2017, you were seeing headlines and titles and, and people demanding investigations be done, and rightfully so, by governing bodies to figure out, again, what happened and how to correct it. So all eyes on Equifax at that time of the year, right? Everybody, I liken it to, you've got, and unfortunately, you have a house in your neighborhood who's on fire. And you have everyone in the neighborhood looking at it, wondering what's going on, what's happening inside the house, how did this happen, and what's going to happen to my home as well that's right next to it, right, uh, in a similar business or neighborhood of work, right? Uh, so we were losing some of the public trust, we Equifax, in September. Uh, and that was, again, very detrimental to the organization, right? 
but like in a fire in real life, in a fire for, for security fire, um, you have individuals who run towards the fire to try to put it out, to try to make things better and try to rebuild and reestablish public trust, right? So that's our scenario of fire. So in October of 2017, I did the weird thing of actually accepting a job at Equifax, less than maybe two weeks after the breach announcement, a, a third party headhunter had contacted me about a possible position. Now, as you'll note from the slide, it's not a security role. It's a QA automation engineer, which up to that point was the primary uh, type of work that I had been doing both in the private sector and in government contracting. So I had a large amount of experience in that field. With, uh, with scripting some automation for functional testing, have some development background, things like that. But when they contacted me, they didn't initially tell me what the company was. It was only after about a week of dealing with the recruiter that this third-party recruiter, I said, yes, I'm interested in it. Could you please tell me the company that's actually for, as they try to protect their commissions sometimes. Uh, so I swear, when I asked that question, the recruiter got real low on the phone, started to kind of whisper and she said, you know, it's where I'm excited that you're interested in the position, but you know, it's the company is Equifax. And I swear she said it in a whisper, almost as if it would scare me off. Right. And probably a lot of uh, potential candidates did run at that word at the time. Uh, so she's very reassuring, opened up to any information. I said, you know what, let's, let's go forward at this point. And, and let me hear what they have to say. Let's see what's going on with Equifax. Um, now, a lot of my colleagues around uh, my area and people I worked with heard when I was pursuing something with Equifax and when I eventually took the job and they said, what have you done? So, you know, always have to throw in, in any presentation, a good Star Wars meme, you know, what have I done here? Uh, when I walked away from the recruiter, it was interesting because I, I kind of came back at, the, at that evening after the talk uh, and said, you know, this is a possibility for a job. I don't know much about the company. I did a little research, found they're much larger than I actually knew. They're way beyond just a credit bureau that keeps track of your score. They're an international conglomerate. They're massive, right? Um, so I started thinking, is this the right career move? As anybody should when they're taking a new position. And I saw an opportunity uh, to actually change my area of focus. Now, everybody who kind of asked me about this, like I, like I said, is what was the motivation? Why would you go to a company that is in this major spotlight, this, the hot seat, right? The organization to every outside observer is on fire. They had a huge data breach. Um, what's going to happen in the next you know, month, the next six months, the next 10 years for this organization, right? And certainly a lot, of, a lot of companies might not have a plan for less than a month after they announce breach. Um, so my answer has always been simple. I wanted to work in security. I always have. Uh, I actually came out of college in, in 2007. And I tried to find positions in security. It was, it was interesting, you know, field to me. It was a lot that couldn't be known, uh, but probably and, and arguably to the detriment of some uh, back in 2007, I mean, smartphones were barely a thing, right? Who is giving out cybersecurity degrees as undergraduate degrees? So I left college with a regular CS degree pursuing any field, any focus of work I could in the IT field. Uh, so without any sort of flood of security opportunities out there, I took the next big thing, right? Go into a software development company who has a product that's doing well, the hot thing software development. Uh, and I bounced around different roles in that, in that area of focus for about a decade uh, with some successes some not so successes on the, on the government side for contracting and, and the private sector as well. But I, I bounced around there for about a decade and I never really felt like I was fulfilling what I wanted to do, right? So when I sat down after speaking with the recruiter, I saw that, hey, this company now has security as a real focus. Whereas at a pre-breach organization, 
you would have to fight and scrap and argue for every dime that you could get to try to do security work, particularly if you haven't been a security person in the past to try to convince higher ups to spend the money. Um, and I like to refer to, to almost all organizations as pre-breach organizations, primarily because no organization, government or private sector or anything in between is immune to a potential breach. So any time that there's an organization that hasn't announced yet, to me, they're just pre-breach. Um, now, the problem that you get with your, with your companies that you may be at now, or, or if you're not doing security work and you want to, is they don't really see a return on investment. It's hard to actually convince a higher up that security will protect their revenue streams, as it's not a thing in itself that typically generates revenue unless you are a security company and that's what you do. Uh, so without that sort of return on investment to motivate them, if you look out and see some of the organizations that are post-breach, you'll start to notice that they have an increased focus. So here's some, just some quick numbers here, real easy to pull. I'm sure a lot of you have, have uh, heard of have I been pwned? So I'm going to give them a little bit of, of, of credit here. Uh, they track breaches that are typically announced and verified and things like that. And I'm just going to lay out here real quick what the past five years have looked like. So have I been pwned? The top numbers uh, over the years here, and years being in circles, are the amount of breaches that occurred that year as tracked by the have I been pwned site. Uh, and down below are some of the more notable ones that you might want to pay attention to. The reason I draw this distinction is there are a lot of organizations being breached. According to the Have I Been Pwned data from the last five years, there are about 64 breaches a year per year for the last five. And that breaks down to about five breaches a month, a little over, actually. Uh, the math's not quite right a little over five breaches. So you're talking about a breach occurring every week of the year on average for the last five years. So the game is out there, right? Organizations are breaching. Now, a lot of these numbers that have my opponent, you're gonna see them as being uh, these companies you don't know very well. They're data aggregation companies. They pull in information. They, they, they buy up your personal data. They tie it together. They help resell it for targeted ads. And that and that work is you know a revenue builder, um, but you might not want to look at those companies after they breach. A lot of times they just vanish into thin air; they disappear, or they've been gone for a while, and it just comes to light that their data was taken. Down below are some of the more notable uh, organizations that you might want to pay attention to if you consider this path into security or this switch. Uh, of course, you, you see way back in 2016, you've got organizations like LinkedIn, the DNC, and the NSA right there. So remember a couple of slides ago, I said no organization is immune to a breach. Even the NSA had a security incident. Uh, and of course, you'll see Equifax in 2017 with some companies, uh, things like Starwood, things like Capital One, even the the awesome words with friends and movie pass uh, organizations, right? And then all the way down to more recently, you have in 2020, right at the end, December, the announcement of the SolarWinds breach. Uh, now that's a, that's a whole different type of game. That's like a supply chain attack, but it's still a security incident and it still requires a security response. So in consideration, when you may be approached by a recruiter who wants to bring you in to an organization that is post-breach, you want to look at a few things. You don't want to jump at the organizations that might be on shaky ground, only been around for a couple of years. So you want to look at that longevity of the organization. Has it been around a long time, right? Um, when I went back after that recruiter came to me, and I tried to decide whether or not I wanted to take a position inside of a post-breach organization. I decided security is what I, I've been wanting to do for a long time. It was a risky move, um, but it was a measured and calculated risk. I had a conversation with my wife that night and said, you know what, if I do this, there is risk, but I, I guarantee you I'm going to be 
doing security work within six months to a year. That was my goal. And within three months, the application uh, development team I was on approached me to do some more of security work. Now, since then, I've taken on a lot of different roles. Uh, I've actually, I've gone from a QA automation engineer to more of an application security engineer doing some, and then on to DevSecOps type of work. I shifted over and did some security platforms and operations work with a lot of scripting, a lot of automation. And now I'm currently within our internal pen testing team. So there's a couple things in those few bullet points that are really important when you make these considerations. And that is when they approached me for, to take on security work, I made sure to have a conversation right up front to say, I want proper training. I need to make sure that security budget is in place as a general business function. How is that looking? What does the timeline look out for funding that you figured out so far? And then the, that ability to shift around, as I mentioned. Now, that's actually really important. And that's why I said at the beginning that even if you're in security right now, this may be a possibility for you, is that it's real hard to change up your jobs. I had never done security before. I had no business taking a security position, but I found an avenue in that allowed me to use my existing skill set and then shift over to something else. And those positions I just listed out, some of them are more blue team. I decided I wanted to go more red. I wanted to be on the offensive side, the pen testing side. And eventually I got there. You kind of, you get an opportunity to figure out what you love and what you want to do. Now, the need is out there. Right. And this is this is super important because as I've told people this over the past several years, when they when I get asked, this, what do you do in security? How did you get in? How did you break that barrier? These organizations that I've been talking about this whole time, they are in desperate need of security. Right. Their house is on fire. They have had a serious incident and they they need security. You can be one of the individuals who chooses to run towards that fire and help not only your own career, but to help the organization. And by doing so, you're also getting the opportunity to help a lot of other people that consume the business services and functions that that organization provides. So Equifax, for instance, is one of three major credit bureaus, right? They service millions of people and track their information. If you have a similar organization that goes through a breach, you going to the organization and bringing your specific skill set from your past can help everybody. It can really help propel you forward. And that's something you should really consider, not in a selfish way to just advance your own career, but in a way that helps bring more skill sets to the field. So that's a big benefit that I want to hit as one of the last notes here in this section is the benefit to security is the broad knowledge that so many people come in with. And there's been so many stories about how, they, how these unorthodox approaches into security, as I mentioned, there was no real security degrees, you know, not that long ago. And it's only recently that people are getting security education at an undergraduate and master's level type of, type of level. Um, so when you come in and you take these routes these, these un, uncommon, you know, path less traveled type of routes, you are bringing in a skill set that, you know, conferences like this love to hear about. People will enjoy to hear your experience coming into security, and it will motivate them to do the same. And that's something that we need, that organizations post-breach need, and that just in general, uh, the, the entire it's kind of social aspect of where things are in the world needs more security. So with that, that was, I know that was a lot to consume. Um, we're going to move on to the second section of my talk. And that is stroke awareness and detection. So before I talked about, yeah, here's how my career progressed. That was a big risk and, and a personal path that I measured, um, measured my approach to, to, to make a change, right? This next section, I'm gonna share with you some information that is, that is very pers personal, um, that uh, I, I do have a very, it has impacted me very, very closely. 
Uh, and I hope that by the end of this section, you will have a greater awareness and a greater sense of uh, detection, right? For to, to steal my own title, right? So right into it, my personal story, uh, my wife, Michelle, on July 11th of 2016, was 29 years old, not old, you know, very young. Uh, and she suffered from an ischemic stroke to the right portion of her pons. Uh, there's a few things in that first bullet point that I'm going to draw out during this during this talk to try to to try to highlight. First is that the age she was, the type of stroke and what a stroke is, and where it can impact things. So first off, alligate an ischemic stroke is actually it's 87% of all strokes that occur. It is when the blood supply to the brain in any section of the brain is obstructed. Typically this occurs with a clot. Uh, it's just, a, it just blocks that blood flow, which of course stops the oxygen flowing to that part of the brain. And with any part of the body that can be extremely dangerous and it's amplified to the nth degree when it occurs in the brain. Uh, so her area where this occurred was the pons, which is actually it's the largest part of the brain stem. It controls so many things. Uh, it controls things like the respiratory rhythm of your breathing. It controls the fundamental uh, REM sleep cycles that you get every night. Uh, but it also, and maybe even more importantly, it acts as a funnel for all the other communications of the upper areas of your brain to communicate with any areas of your body, whether that's conscious or unconscious motor functions or just base level uh, activities that your body carries out, right? Um, and then if you are trying to wrap your head around it a little bit, think of the pons as like the router of your network, right? Inside of your brain, your upper brain, all of your devices inside of your home network are carrying out specific functions and they're trying to reach outside the network. All of that funnels right through the pons and then goes out to the rest of the body and is also the choke point of all the communications coming back up to the brain. So the pons is particularly dangerous if a, if a stroke occurs there. Now I highlight a couple of these next points uh, because it's important and it drives home why you need awareness in this subject. She got attention almost immediately, medical attention. Even with that, the hospital did not check for a stroke until after seven hours in care. Now there's, there's a lot of reasons why that happened. Uh, she did not have any high risk major risk things that would elevate the likelihood she was having a stroke. She was not obese. She did not have smoke. She wasn't a drinker. She had no family history of stroke at all. And all of those things led them in the direction to check for things like it has to be something with her lungs or her heart or something else is off in her balance of, of, uh, of nutrients or something. So they spent a long time checking for that. Um, in hindsight, knowing what I know now, she was exhibiting several signs of a stroke right from the beginning, and that worsened over time. So hopefully this will help uh, illuminate what you know about strokes. Now here's a little cross-section. This is, this is my wife's brain taken not long after the stroke. This is an MRI image of two cross-sections. Where that yellow line is on the left image goes right through where she uh, had her stroke. That's right where the pons is. Uh, so everything above is all that brain, that upper brain function, uh, specific areas handling very specific things in your body. But at the pons, you can kind of see where it narrows down until it gets to the spinal cord at the, at the base of the brain stem. So that's what I meant when I said all the thought goes through there. And on the image on the right, what you can see is these are single MRI slices of imagery. And you'll see a sort of brightened spot that's in that center of the image on the right. And it covers almost all of that side. Now these are, these are MRI images, so they are flipped. So what you're looking at on the left side is actually the right side of her brain. 
but that whole area lost blood supply, lost oxygen for a significant period of time. And that highlighted area on there is actually representation, representation of dead tissue. It doesn't take long for your, for your brain tissue to die if it's starved of oxygen, very short period of time. So I wanted to show you this image so you get an idea of where these things occur uh, and what it can look like on an MRI. So it can be very impactful. As a lot of people know, the right side of your brain and the brainstem controls the left side of your body and vice versa. So that level of impact in, uh, in that area of her brain impacted almost her entire body on the left side. So I said that there was a, a highlight on that first slide of this section from, from what happened to, to Michelle, my wife, is that she was 29 years old. Uh, it's important to realize that stroke has no age limits. There is no such thing as I'm too, I'm too young to be having a stroke or he's too young to be experiencing these symptoms. Strokes actually happen in children and in infants, uh, not, not I'm not trying to raise fire alarms or anything like that, but they do happen. It's, I don't wanna say it's the most occurrences, but in 2009, one of the studies from CDC, American Stroke Association, there were 34% of all people hospitalized from stroke were under the age of 65. And I guarantee you talk to most people and they think they, it, strokes happen to older people and strokes happen to people with, uh, with a lot of, of risk factors associated with it, right? That, that might amplify that, that thinking, right? But a third of all the strokes happen under that 65 age cap. And, and a, little, a little warning sign in here, I am in the Southeast of the United States. Uh, it is the country's highest death rates for strokes. So if you, if you wanna see some heat maps and where these things occur, just as a little bit more of that deeper data dive, uh, the CDC and the American Stroke Association, they have a lot of these heat maps, a lot of this, this raw data that you can consume. I really encourage each and every one of you to go out there and take a look at these resources. Um, I promise you, if it is happening to somebody you love or somebody at your workplace, you are not going to have the time to go and look these things up, all right? Even a cursory awareness of these, of these things is enough to help somebody tremendously. So I wanna move forward into one of the stroke identification methods that are out there. And a lot of these things I try to come up with, with good ac acronyms so that you can remember what to do and some sort of a word association um, so I'll walk through this a little bit, and this graph is on dukehealth.org. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, they have some great resources uh, on that site as well regarding stroke. Um, but the main areas to focus on for if someone's having a stroke and how to detect it is B, balance, right? If somebody is suddenly very unbalanced, if they can't stand at all, or even if they're just a little dizzy, right? That's one indicator that they may be having a stroke. Now you could say very easily that, well, a lot of things make you dizzy and that's true. What you want to look for that heightens the probability that somebody's having a stroke is if they start to exhibit several of these. The so second one is eyes where a person might suddenly lose vision in one or both eyes or actually become just disoriented. They're unable to focus. They get they have double vision. Uh, so it can present itself in a few different ways. I know this slide focuses on if they lost vision completely. The truth is a number of individuals before they have their full-on stroke have a series of mini strokes leading up to it where the clot may be traveling and dislodging and lodging along the way and can produce these symptoms in, in a lesser way or periodically. Uh, the third one is F for face. Now, what you're going to want to look for there is try to have somebody that may be experiencing these things to smile or to raise their eyebrows up. If one side of their mouth refuses to raise up, the muscles aren't really reacting, or if an eyebrow is not going all the way up to the, to the height of the other, that's a very serious indicator 
that their muscles are not receiving the neural impulse impulses from the brain to perform a function that is normally done in unison across a face. Uh, so, and the fourth one is arms. This is, this is important here as well. I am say, say it's important. These are all very important. Um, arms, what you're going to do with someone is tell them to put their arms straight out. If they're laying down, that's fine too. Put their arms flat and try raising them up at the same, at the same rate. And what you'll find is, again, if the brain is su suffering from this level of trauma, it's not sending those neural impulses to the muscles to respond. It's not a question of muscle weakness. It's a question of receiving the signals to do an action. So if somebody's having an issue with their arms, and it can even just be numbness. Like I said, numbness on its own is not a cause for concern usually. You want to look for pairings of these conditions. Now, the fifth one on here for speech is probably stands out the most, right? So all of these ones leading up to this, these are actions that you're perceiving physically. The speech pathway that, ha that is impacted by a stroke is one of the most apparent that you can have. It is slurred speech, a uh, person's inability to focus, to find the right words, to describe how they're feeling. Um, and that can progress over time. Now, I, I'm, I've called back progressing over time a couple, couple of times here, and I'm gonna tell you why in a, in a little bit. Uh, but first, T is time, and this one is nothing to do with the person's condition. It is just to emphasize that the best thing you can do for somebody who may be having a stroke is rapidly call the first responders that you have. The EMTs, get an ambulance and get them to some medical care as quickly as you can. Uh, and this, again, this is not about, uh, it's a T there for specific, specific emphasis because the treatments that a hospital can provide to someone having a stroke will reduce based on how long you wait. And the best example of this is there's something called a TPA injection, TPA. And what that is, is it's like a super clot buster. It's like a, it's like a blood thinner ramped up to 11, right? And what they use this for is to, is to give you that injection and to try to break up whatever is, is stopping that blood flow and that oxygen supply to your brain. Now, I say this with the time because there is a time limitation on this. A TPA shot or injection can only be given within the first three or four and a half hours of when stroke symptoms start. So if you're at home and it takes you two hours to get to the hospital because you waited a little while or it's traffic or for whatever reason, if you start falling outside of that window, hospitals will not take the risk. Now there's other limiting factors as well. Um, if you are on any sort of blood thinners for regular reasons, any at all, uh, a hospital will be very hesitant to give you a TPA shot as well. And this has to do with, it's, it's going to double up on that blood thinning activity. And this can unfortunately lead in some cases to additional, instead of blockage of blood, an actual internal bleed. This could result in a brain bleed because they're trying to break that clot up and it reacts with medication you're on for some other regular condition that you're usually taking. Now, you may say, why have this injection if you can never use it? The fact is for younger people, they tend to shy away a little bit, but that's again under understanding that most strokes occur in the older age group, right? And when someone's older and less able to bounce back or recover, the risks of giving them an injection that may have side effects start to lessen. The benefits are better to save a person's life than to potentially do some harm, right? And that's a call for the physician to make, for the hospital, for their risk. Uh, but you increase those options the faster you react. So I said how in a few of these uh, it may be combinations. It may be uh, develop over time. And there are a lot of people who experience mini strokes before their primary main stroke that occurs. This was the case with my wife. At the time, 
she was working on a military base uh, in our town. Now that base is locked off. You need identification to get on. You need to be able to access it. She was at work in the morning and she started experiencing immediately. She experienced B, E, and S. She experienced three out of five of the indicators that she was having a stroke, but nobody really picked up on it. She was laying on the floor. Thankfully, coworkers were there. They immediately called an EMT, but you have to be aware of these and try to spread it beyond just you and your family because you may not be there. I physically couldn't access my wife when she had her first series of strokes at the office, on the base that I didn't have access to. Thankfully, I had worked on there before and I had contact with people who were on there and a friend escorted me on the base, but I still couldn't enter the building. So it was entirely up to these coworkers to identify this, but also the EMTs more importantly. And I thank, I'm thankful that the coworkers were there and, at, and called the medical professionals immediately. It, it did a lot for her. But once she was in the EMT's care, she was already exhibiting three out of five of the signs she was having a stroke. And still, they didn't pick up that it was a stroke because she didn't have risk factors that would put her in those categories. They weren't looking for it because it was unlikely, right? Now, the symptoms over time, as we were in the hospital and they were getting ready to discharge my wife, where they said, start packing up, go home. We checked your chest, your heart. You know, everything looks okay. We don't know why you're dizzy. She started developing face and arm weakness. And it was only then that we said, hey, you know, she can't lift her left arm. She, oh, she might be groggy because of the meds we put. No, she can't lift her. She can lift her right arm fine. And I didn't even know what we were looking at it then. And the hospital eventually said, you know what, let's start imaging her brain to see if there's something there. And it was only then, after hours, well outside of the window of TPA injections and sitting around in a hospital for a long time that we actually got some attention. Now, we're, we're winding down here, um, getting close to the end of the talk, but I wanted to highlight some of the aftermath of a stroke. All right. So to kind of prepare you if, God forbid, somebody in your family or somebody in your friends or work has a stroke as to what they may be dealing with and what, if you are that support person, should be prepared to deal with. Number one is all strokes have lasting effects. There is no such thing, no such thing as a full recovery from a stroke. I say that again, there's no such thing as a full recovery. They may get close, they may appear well, and they may be able to do a lot, but there is no going back to that pre-stroke state. There's just not. It can have, it can have, uh, it can manifest in a lot of ways, right? What those lasting effects may be. Uh, for example, example, memory issues, right? To an outside observer, memory issues is not very apparent. And you may not know. Uh, there can be lasting weakness. And again, it's not a question of muscular atrophy or anything like that. In some cases, they may just lack the neural impulses in order to talk to anything, right? To, to stimulate the muscles to, to do that contraction or that relaxed motion that they require. And in a very real way, a lot of stroke uh, a lot of stroke survivors, they, they suffer from PTSD, right? Imagine that you're experiencing some of these symptoms. You start to get a little dizzy. You start to feel faint, things like that. And it turns out you had a stroke, right? And you've got to go through this long, painful recovery process. Anytime you start to feel that same way, that whole experience is going to flood back to you. That whole fear, you're going to, you, you can relive it over and over. None of these things I've listed out are readily apparent from an outside observer. And I'm really pushing on, on these points because it, it's so important when you're talking to a stroke survivor to be aware of this. When a stroke happens and a piece of the brain tissue dies, even as thin as an MRI slice across a cross section of the brain, the brain must try to reform 
and create new neural pathways to perform the functions that it can no longer communicate to the body. That level of success can vary wildly, and it requires a lot of intense focused care. So for my wife's situation, she spent 16 days in the ER or the ICU and inpatient rehab, relearning the basic daily living actions like walking and making food and grabbing utensils before they release her. Even after that, months of outpatient rehab therapy. So when you are talking to somebody who had a stroke, I know you might be coming from a very supportive and encouraging way, but when you might say, you look great, you look like you fully recovered, please be aware that you may not be seeing all of the impacts the stroke really had as a lasting effect on that individual. So with that, that's the end of part two for me. Um, I hope that you learned something. I hope you enjoyed both some career information and, and experience, as well as learned something for awareness for, uh, for stroke. Um, this is me here on Twitter. Twitter if you uh, want to follow me, uh, you'll get a lot of retweets or replies with Star Wars gifts. I promise you that much. Um, but thank you for attending. I really appreciate you taking the time and listening. And again, I hope you learned something. Thanks a lot. And thank you, Chris, for uh, helping us out with that information. Uh, during the second portion of your talk, especially, uh, there was a lot of talk in the chat channels from uh, several people, actually, who had experienced strokes or who had close family who had also experienced strokes as well. Um, very critical and important information uh, on how to recognize them and on the criticality of time. Uh, so I, I thank you very much for, for this.